You can find almost anything if you look in the fossil record that resembles something else. That means nothing. Paleontologist Lawrence Whitmer of Ohio University in a commentary stated, Perhaps the time has come to finally accept that Archaeopteryx was just another small, feathered, bird-like theropod fluttering around in the Jurassic. What do evolutionists say about fully modern birds found in the early strata before Archaeopteryx supposedly evolved these fused fingers together? You guessed it, nothing. Stephen J. Gould said, It's a curious mosaic, not a transitional fossil. Even the stink bird, alive today, is a species of tropical bird found in swamps, forests, and mangroves in the Amazon and in South America. It is notable for having chicks that possess claws. The truth? Hand claws are actually widespread in modern birds, and not all that unusual. Ornithologists say Archaeopteryx is a bird, as what paleontologists say it's a dinosaur, not even a consensus between the sciences. The new rave in evolutionism is that birds are just dinosaurs, and that dinosaurs evolved into birds. There is a joke that KFC should change its name to KFD, Kentucky Fried Dinosaur. But not all of evolutionary scientists accept this nonsense. A proponent is one renowned ornithologist, Alan Fiducci of the University of North Carolina. He recently stated, the theory that birds are the equivalent of living dinosaurs and that dinosaurs were feathered is full of holes, so much so that creationists have jumped all over it. He further laments, with the advent of feathered dinosaurs, we are truly witnessing the beginning of the meltdown of the field of paleontology. Those looking for evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs will be disappointed because the creator told us that he created birds before land animals, such as dinosaurs. In 1994, the esteemed journal Science shocked the scientific world by publishing sequence data from DNA retrieved from dinosaur bone thought to be 80 million years old. DNA is a fragile molecule, and so it breaks down quickly. Measurements of DNA stability suggest that it could only last thousands of years, at best, only under perfect conditions but 80 million years was just too incredible for skeptical scientists. Eventually, these skeptics were vindicated, as it became apparent that the original researchers had sequenced contaminated human DNA, not dinosaur DNA. However, in 2012, a different group of researchers published new results supporting the discovery of actual dinosaur DNA. These new results eventually became impossible to disprove or avoid, with the researchers applying multiple checks against contamination from non-dinosaur sources. The preservation of dinosaur DNA doesn't make any sense from an evolutionary perspective, but it fits the biblical history whereby dinosaurs lived thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. Evolutionists have to invoke rescuing devices to get around these problems, like usual. How do you think our view of dinosaurs would change if everyone knew scientists found carbon-14 in their bones? Well, a group of geophysicists have discovered exactly that, carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. This is indeed a shocking proposal for those who believe that the last dinosaur died out 65 million years ago. Because carbon-14 decays so fast that it could not possibly survive that long. There should be not one atom of carbon-14 present in dinosaur bones if they are really as old as they claim to be. After going to great lengths to rule out contamination, the researchers concluded that they had indeed found carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. These results seriously undermine the evolutionary story of long ages in Earth's history. However, they fit nicely with the biblical history where dinosaurs lived only thousands of years ago. In the early 90s, researchers from Montana State University made an amazing discovery. Inspecting a piece of T-Rex bone under a microscope, they could hardly believe their eyes. They could see dinosaur red blood cells. This discovery prompted lead scientist Mary Schweitzer to say, it is exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course, I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? In the A Discover Magazine article, Dr. Schweitzer explained further her response. If you take blood cell samples and you stick them on the shelf, you have nothing recognizable in about a week. Why would there be anything left in dinosaurs? Well, the only reason there would be anything left in dinosaurs comes down to there being iron in the blood. However, this excuse falls short, as you are about to see. But first, let's touch on two other reasons that this cannot happen. 
As I am explaining these two other major problems with why dinosaur bones cannot be 65 million years old, look at all the findings of soft tissue discovered recently and how they know to look for it now, rather than just assume it doesn't exist at all. Problem number one, the mostly left-handed amino acids that should be equally right-handed and left-handed if they were Jurassic, they are not there. The laws of chemistry demonstrate that after death, amino acids go back to a 50-50 mixture of right and left-handed amino acids. The England's Royal Society published a time range for when this physical process to occur, which produces totally racemized amino acids in 100,000 to 1 million years maximum. So, obviously, that is not even close to 65 million years old. Another problem, the amino acid methionine is very susceptible to strong oxidizing agents like hydrosol, which would quickly oxidize methionine into methionine sulfoxide. The Nature Communication Study results revealed unoxidized methionine in some of the Alberta dinosaur specimens. Also consider this. The research on the Egyptian mummies has established a 10,000 year upper limit for how long biological molecules can survive. Now, back to iron for just a moment. If you want to see the rescuing device for iron preservation fail in real time, it's easy. Just look for yourself. One of the most striking examples of soft tissue preservation in dinosaur fossils. If you look at the photos in the paper, you see no evidence of iron particles. The only place she saw iron was inside partially degraded tissue. You see, iron in blood, which gets released at death, cannot preserve all soft tissue decay for millions of years because it still degrades collagen proteins, which have also been found in some specimens. So while iron might preserve some soft tissue, it obviously is not responsible for all soft tissue preservation. Also consider that iron would be incapable of preserving soft dinosaur tissue if it could actually distribute it from the dinosaur's blood throughout all the tissue. Of course, Mary Schweitzer and her team totally submerged specimens to preserve them to obtain the results they desired. But the only way to accomplish this naturally is distributed by water. Well, guess what? That brings up another huge problem, as water also degrades soft tissue before iron can preserve it. In addition to this, soft tissue has also been found in bones, not directly associated with iron-rich blood, like in the bone horn of the Triceratops and bird feathers. The old earth idea was developed historically, not from letting the physical facts speak for themselves, but by imposing anti-biblical philosophical assumptions onto their geological observations, the idea driving the conclusion. The new rave in evolutionism is that birds are just dinosaurs and that dinosaurs evolved into birds. There is a joke that KFC should change its name to KFD, Kentucky Fried Dinosaur. But not all of evolutionary scientists accept this nonsense. A proponent is one renowned ornithologist, Alan Fiducci of the University of North Carolina. He recently stated, the theory that birds are the equivalent of living dinosaurs and that dinosaurs were feathered is full of holes, so much so that creationists have jumped all over it. He further laments, with the advent of feathered dinosaurs, we are truly witnessing the beginning of the meltdown of the field of paleontology. Those looking for evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs will be disappointed because the creator told us that he created birds before land animals, such as dinosaurs. The old earth idea was developed historically, not from letting the physical facts speak for themselves, but by imposing anti-biblical philosophical assumptions onto their geological observations, the idea driving the conclusion. Uh, my scientific colleagues go to places like Greenland, the Arctic, they go to Antarctica, and they drill into the ice with hollow drill bits. It's not that extraordinary. Many of you have probably done it yourselves, uh, drilling other things, uh, hole saws to put locks and doors, for example. And we pull out long cylinders of ice, long ice rods. And these are made of snow. And by long tradition, it's called snow ice. Bill Nye here thinks that because they test ice core layers up to 680,000 years old, that that alone is enough to disprove young earth creationism and prove long scale evolution to be true. What he doesn't know is that this argument does not help his cause whatsoever. Let me explain. 
when it comes to the ice core layers. We actually found the what's called the Lost Squadron. And the Lost Squadron were a plane that were lost during World War II. And when a very rich man wanted to come along and he wanted to buy those planes and put them on his property or start a museum, not really sure which one he wanted to do. He wanted to go find these planes. So he spent a lot of money and he went out there and he assumed that he would just see the planes, but he couldn't. And they were actually so far down that when they actually dug down, they found them, uh, which would have been an equivalent of 135,000 years because the layers weren't laid down every year. They were laid down by cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot. So the prediction of ice core layers, when they see those strata, which look like they're annual, are actually just dependent on the day or the season, and they can fluctuate and change. This is probably one of the most simple and basic evidences that dinosaurs lived with man. This is the original photo found in Utah. The Native Americans drew it on a stone. They actually used a pecking mechanism to pound this into the rock. Anybody can look at this image and realize that it's a dinosaur. You could show it to a five-year-old and they will recognize it as a dinosaur. It even has a face on it. You can see the mouth and eyes. When a skeptic looks at this, however, they don't see it. I don't know why, but they don't. As a matter of fact, a lot of them say, no, what they were actually drawing was probably just a lizard. Well, I am not convinced of this argument, because look, you can tell they know what a lizard looks like. Here's a goat. Here are some snakes. Yet, look at this. So I believe they drew what they saw, and this video will be my theory. See, to make rock carving images, ancient natives used an object to chip away the original rock in a process called pecking, which leaves behind tiny holes or divots. In a recent report, researchers tried to discredit this interesting depiction of a dinosaur by saying, the legs are not part of the image, they are not pecked or otherwise man-made, but they are stained of mud or some other light-colored material or mineral. As their sketch here shows, they maintain that what looks like a dinosaur is really just a snake glyph with a stain below it. Evolutionary biologist Phil Center co-authored a paper in an online journal asserted the theropod-like image was not what it appears to be. They wrote that it is a composite of two separate petroglyphs and that its apparent legs were created by a mud or mineral stain. They claim that this artifact is now officially discredited, which of course would be the sigh of relief news for evolutionist and dinosaur age and bad news for the creation model of Earth's history. Fortunately, since the method used in the study was basically done just by looking at the artifact, virtually anyone can cross-check the author's observation, which is exactly what has been done, with common sense testing. But first, they lie about the lower body portion only being stained, and no peck marks making up the lower body, as peck marks extend down into the presumed body of the petroglyph even extending down into the area where the legs are, contrary to what they tell the public. Here are some pictures of this. Daryl Robbins documented this petroglyph in the summer of 2010. The body and leg area pecking divots were obvious to Robbins, who after reading Center's report, replied, From my picture, it is clear that the whole dinosaur shape is chipped into the rock surface not just a mud stain. It's pretty sad when a lowly IT guy does better scientific investigations than scientists. There is a difference between being debunked and being declared debunked. This petroglyph has not really been discredited as a dinosaur except through mass media. They know that the average person cannot access these easily without a ladder to see them for themselves, so they know that they can just get away with saying what they want and people will just believe it. similar to what evolutionary theory has become today, belief and imagination about something that happened that is not observable or testable or repeatable. So upon a huge ledge where this petroglyph is that depicts this large dinosaur, 
Jan Cameron did an extensive rock art rubbing of the dinosaur image. She was commissioned by a Canadian government to do a rock art rubbing on fossils because it picked up details that the human eye cannot see. Her scientific analysis absolutely reveals that it is a dinosaur. The dinosaur image was made using a hammer stone and a deer antler tent. They would peck hundreds of holes to get the proper texture and create the image seen still today on these rock formations. So when someone can walk up, place a sheet of thick paper over the image and rub chalk over it and get the perfect image of a dinosaur, including using USB portable microscopes and multiple gauge tools to help verify that it is indeed what it looks like, then why believe the so-called experts who just walked up, looked at it, and wielded some story without conducting any scientific experiments? Oh, that's right, never mind, don't question them. They're the paid, true experts. Now, let's give them this and say that the image of this dinosaur is not a dinosaur and it is a complete fraud, even though that's not true. Now we have a huge problem as well for them, because there's a second seropod dinosaur immediately to its right of the first, with its head turned back looking at the other, and its tail going underneath the neck of the first. So now they have to discredit two dinosaurs, which they never show nor talk about in pictures, both with peck marks that are made up of their entire bodies not stains. Stack this with the other evidence of Native American artifacts and the scientific discovery of seropod cooperlites in the area, then the evolutionary dogma of 65 million year old dinosaur crumbles. I urge you to return to common sense. If you want to let them sprinkle on academic stupidity dust on it and just let them lie to you and try to jam another rescuing device down your throat, trying to tell you it's anything but what it obviously is, then be my guest. But the obvious peck marks throughout, the clear visual outline, the rock art cast rubbings made, the fact that there are two dinosaurs side by side, and the many photographs taken by many different people that all show it's clearly a dinosaur by anyone who has common sense looking at these things, then I think it's pretty safe to say we don't need the indoctrinated fear mongers to come along and try to tell you it's all made up. I fear evolutionary paleontologists are highly indoctrinated, so they cannot see the obvious sometimes right in front of them. They can suffer from paranoia because the current living dinosaur is a paleontologist nightmare. It is a smashing blow to evolutionism, which means they would have to admit what they have told everyone was wrong, what they teach is wrong, and what they believe themselves is wrong. Their cognitive dissonance will never allow it. I urge you to investigate Native American legends and artifacts depicting dinosaur-like creatures. It should leave your mind far more open to the possibility that humans depicted what they saw, because no other logical conclusion could be made as to why people worldwide made up such things. People like Bill Nye here state specifically, you never find a higher modern day animal mixed in with a lower animal from an ancient time period in the fossil record. Well, he is outright wrong because he, like most people, have never heard of the Ashley Phosphate Beds of South Carolina, which is a shame because it is the best piece of evidence to ever exist currently that man has lived alongside of dinosaurs without question. The Ashley Phosphate Bed is the largest graveyard ever found. This information has been forgotten by the sands of time, but I am going to bring it back. Today, the Ashley Phosphate Bed is mined for its high quantities of phosphate, which is being used for fertilizer, so there is great money to be made. These sedimentary layers are huge, 
covering large portions of the Carolinas and extending into Florida all the way up into Canada. World famous geologist at the time, Louis Agassiz, described the phosphate beds as the greatest graveyard he had ever known. The phosphate beds are so full of bones that it is believed by scientists that the phosphate itself is made from bone. So, if the Ashley phosphate bed is loaded with such an incredible amount of fossils as to cause the leading geologist and zoologist of his day to call them the greatest graveyard he had ever known, you should ask yourself why has zero mention of this ever been brought up? The fossils completely ravage the evolutionary timeline, that's why. Remember, if the geologic column is out of place, even in one area on Earth, then it falsifies the theory of evolution, and that the layers form slowly, and that they represent time. Well, when you look at this one place, where there's an 18 inch thick layer, you will see why it's suppressed. In it are rare fossils of everything from whales and porpoises, fish, sharks, megalodon shark, toads, crocodiles, alligators, turtles, rabbits, monkeys, horses, camels, elephants, mammoth, mastodon, rhinoceroses, giant sloth, muskrats, deer, pig, dogs, hadrosaur dinosaurs, iguanodon dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and human bones teeth, and artifacts, all within the same layer. Professor S.F. Holmes, the paleontologist and curator of the College of Charleston's National History Museum, described the fossil graveyard in a report to the Academy of Natural Sciences. He stated, Remains of the hog, the horse, and other animals of recent date, together with human bones, mingled in with the bones of mastodon and extinct giant lizards. And this is on record. The occurrence of a hadrosaur dinosaur remains in the Ashley phosphate beds has not been dealt with in the secular science literature really at all. Only two sources exist. They have kept it silent, which is typical. The sad part is, when they first uncovered the relics of the human bone, they immediately became afraid. They, without hesitation, considered their jobs to be at a loss, so they said that the bone was out of place to one another. They immediately threw it in the river to be erased from history and hidden from all view. They knew that such a find would cause them to either probably lose their jobs or their grant funding. And this is all the way back in the late 1800s, they were still in fear of the government from evolutionary dogma, as Darwin's theory had now taken hold. The scientists who studied this knew exactly what they had found. This is why their deep concern for finding such anomalies. Professor of Geology and Paleontology F.S. Holmes believed in the conventional evolutionary sequence. So he knew full well that humans and dinosaurs should not be found in the same layer. In fact, he wrote, Not long after finding the above-named relics of human workmanship and engaged in our usual visits to the Ashley bed, a bone was found projecting from the bluff. Immediately in contact with the surface of the stormy stratum, we pulled it out and behold a human bone. Without hesitation, it was condemned an accidental occupant of quarters to which had no right geologically, and so we threw it into the river. Alas, we have lived to regret our temerity and rashness. A year later, a lower jawbone with teeth was taken from the same bed, and now we have it in the cabinet. After the news became public, I guess Holmes saw no reasons to cower from his discovery anymore, as Holmes portrayed a dinosaur with a man on the cover of his own book. Evolutionists have admitted that if dinosaurs are ever found with humans, then they would admit that the Noah's Flood was real and that man did live alongside of dinosaurs, and that the biblical timeline is true. Because this evidence would validate that the Earth is young and that they had been lied to about our ancient history, 
There is no rescuing device for them, either, because the Ashley phosphate beds had no layers to them. All of the fossils are mixed together in one huge pool of bones, 18 inches thick, covering 200 miles, with no layers found anywhere. The experts who spent considerable time excavating in the phosphate beds have said that there are no layers, and not even a remote resemblance of a layer. It is all one graveyard. You can learn more about the Ashley Phosphate Bed in a book called Man, Dinosaur, and Mammals Together, written by the late geologist John Watson, available at Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. A statement from the book says, Since remains of land animals and sea animals were found together, a catastrophic event would have included the burial of enormous numbers of animals and their subsequent conversion into the rock phosphate over a region of the least 200 miles by 30 miles in extent, which is only partially exposed apart. Such an event is of the order and magnitude of the worldwide Noetic Flood. More good evidence is that we also have multiple pieces of physical observable tracks from around the world where human and dinosaur footprints are found together and even in some cases overlapping. It would be anecdotal if it was just a single footprint but we find multiple prints throughout the world and in many different dinosaur strata. Now if I were to tell a skeptic about this the first thing that they say is they want visual proof so, once you supply that, they next claim that it could be anything, even though nothing on Earth looks like a human's foot. But regardless, that's what they say, and this is easy to answer and a rebuttal. The police forensic investigators have actually taken a look at some of these tracks and have confirmed that indeed they are human tracks. So that nullifies their worthless response. The most famous tracks in America or should I say, were in America, are in Glen Rose, Texas. When they first discovered the tracks, it was huge for creationists. They actually called Nova and had them come and filmed them on site because of this. So Nova was the first to film the dig discovery for each human footprint alongside dinosaur. Creationists insisted that the dig be filmed, telling the public that they wanted verifiable proof through the media live on TV. Unfortunately, there were a couple atheist evolutionists who worked for the company. Nova ended up not doing their job whatsoever, not filming any of the tracks nor the dig. But when they interviewed one another, he was quick to say on live camera that he had not seen anything here to disprove evolution. What he didn't tell the camera was that he had refused to even turn around and look at the tracks that they were working on. When the dig found one, they would tap him on the shoulder and say, Sir, would you like to take a look at this? And he would say, No, I don't want to see it. He stood with his back to the dig and the tracks while making these statements the entire time. After this, they left, and the original photos were taken, which ended up being very important, because the very next day, on August 12, 1989, when Don Patterson spoke at the Creation Conference in Dayton, he presented the evidence of pictures to all of the people present. Two well-known evolutionist atheists were present. One of them disrupted the presentation because of their hatred towards creationism. Both had flown from Dallas the morning before and went directly to the Paluxy River. It is reported that they were in the river that afternoon and one of them, named Glenn Kuban, was with an iron bar, smashing the footprints. Three days after they had destroyed the footprints, they left. And this is the result we get today. Now, for physical evidence of Noah's Ark, we have discovered two amazing things. At the base of Mount Ararat, they discovered many drog stones. These gigantic stones are strewn about as though they were cut from the ship as the water receded. They are almost in a straight line pattern over eight miles approaching the mountains. What these are for is counterbalance for a ship during huge waves. When they discovered these, they wanted to actually put this to the test and see that if a ship which weighed as much and was shaped like the Ark, would it withstand massive tidal waves? 
the results show perfect results that line up exactly with what we would expect if Noah's Ark was true. The next amazing find is they found the cover that Noah placed over the ark. As far as we know, there's nothing else like this anywhere. Nobody's ever... It's got crosses uh, that are very faintly carved on it. You got, a big, you got a big one here. You got a small one right there. One here. You ever seen... It looks like a little bit like pine bark. It sounds like metal. Stone this isn't an anchor stone. Oh, at one point it says, and uh, uh, Noah came out of the ark and he took the cover off, or he yeah. threw the cover off. This is a rather unique thing. It has the appearance and the texture of some kind of a bark. That is a cross. That is a cross. There you go. That is incredible. It has a very hollow sound. Very hollow. It sounds like metal. 